This is Southern Cross News with Joe Palmer. Good evening, everyone. A 17-year-old motorcyclist has been killed in a crash with a truck at Risdon Vale overnight. Police are investigating what contributed to the collision, including if the motorcycle's light was switched on. Emergency services block Sugarloaf Road at Risdon Vale. Forensic officers examining the scene by torchlight. Police say shortly after 7 o'clock, a truck was turning onto the road when a motorcycle came in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, the motorcycle has struck the rear driver's side of the tray just in front of the rear wheel. Uh, as a result of that, the uh, rider uh, received uh, fatal injuries. The 17-year-old from Herdsman's Cove was pronounced dead at the scene. The driver of the truck wasn't hurt. The uh, truck driver, as I said, a 67-year-old uh, man from uh, Risdon Vale, was not physically injured. However, he was uh, badly uh, shaken and uh, upset by the event. Police don't believe drugs or alcohol were a factor in the crash, but are yet to determine the exact cause and possible contributing factors. Well, the factors we're looking at uh, is uh, were the lights uh, on the motorcycle uh, displayed, uh, the speed of the motorcycle. Uh, I'm satisfied at the present time the speed of the uh, truck was not excessive. Crash investigators say they'd like to hear from anyone who saw either vehicle before the crash or anyone who witnessed the crash. Information can be provided to Crime Stoppers. Michael Breen, Southern Cross News. A Tasmanian coroner has today handed down findings that the death of 45-day-old BJ Adam Johnston in 2012 was caused by severe head trauma inflicted by his father. The court hearing the baby could still be alive had there not been extensive failings within the Child Protection Service and Tasmania Police. And a warning, this story may distress some viewers. Coroner Olivia McTaggart handed down today's findings here at the Hobart Magistrates Court. The room was empty, bar some lawyers, the media and the victim's mother, who appeared via video link from Victoria and who was visibly distressed. Coroner McTaggart found the six-week-old baby died on the 28th of November 2012 from two episodes of severe trauma to his head inflicted by his father, Simon Johnston. The injuries on the baby's body were described as abuse of the most severe kind and started before the newborn was released from hospital, continuing until the day he died at the Royal Hobart Hospital. The coroner said she could not pinpoint the exact incidences leading to the child's death. The court heard BJ's mother, Fleur Atkin, did not exercise her duty of care and protect her child, but that history of domestic violence between her and the baby's father was a contributor. The court also hearing the infant might still be alive if Child Protection Services had acted on a series of notifications from witnesses to the baby's abuse. Ms McTaggart said there were extensive failings from the department that reflect entrenched systematic and cultural deficiencies in their context of inadequate resourcing. Recommendations include developing child protection liaison officer positions in the north and northwest of the state, paediatrician examinations if a child under six months has bruising, electronic copies of abuse notifications and more power to the department secretary to investigate children at risk. The Minister for Human Services, Jackie Petrusma, says her department has already significantly increased resourcing and the system is being redesigned. This is a tragedy that happened back in 2012 under the previous government. We will, as a government, uh, look at the findings and recommendations in that report and then we'll comment later. Labor also saying it will examine the recommendations and that the report highlights failures in the system that can't be ignored. The report found police failed to act in a timely manner on reports of abuse. Tasmania Police says it is considering findings on whether all officers should be trained on dealing with reports of child abuse or neglect. Coroner McTaggart saying the inquest was a lengthy and difficult process for all involved. BJ's father was sentenced to two and a half years in jail in 2013 for the ill treatment of a child. But as the exact circumstances could not be determined, there is no indication he'll be charged with a further offence. Louise Hedger, Southern Cross News. Bell Reeve residents have gate crashed a government event announcing a new aged care facility on public land. They confronted the Human Services Minister and the proposed service provider, saying they haven't been consulted. 
what was meant to be a good news story for the state government, taken over by concerned residents. This is just not the area for this kind of development. Demanding answers over today's announcement that an aged care facility is set to go ahead on this government-owned land in Bell Reeve. All that area up there is still to be used. We're only just yes, still to be used, and that's another concern too. The proposal includes affordable accommodation for up to 50 low-income residents. While most care facilities accept people over 65 years old, this one would accept people as young as 50. We'll be the only second state in Australia to actually provide this very specialist model of care for people aged over 50 who need uh, residential aged care beds. We've been growing rapidly every year because there is a large gap of people who are uh, prematurely aged. I might say that most of our clients are over 65, but at least we have the opportunity to take younger people if necessary. The state government is committing $12 million to the project and says construction should be ready to start in 2018-19. But it's yet to go through the planning process and is already facing strong opposition from neighbours. Ages from 50 onwards. That is not aged care. So to call it an aged care facility is exactly what you're saying. It's not the truth. So hopefully um, the residents can see that and have their say. We haven't had any consultation and the first we uh, have known is today. The operator, Winteringham, says the project will be low density and its similar developments in Victoria have been welcomed by neighbours. We want to have consultation with the community so they can actually see the benefit that this facility will bring. A community forum will be held tomorrow night. Michael Breen, Southern Cross News. A key piece of land in the heart of Launceston's CBD will soon be opened up for development. As part of the federal government's city deal, the historic Patterson Barracks near the Esplanade will be relocated, paving the way for new opportunities. Since 1828, the Patterson Barracks has been home to many Army, Navy and Air Force cadets. But the site could soon be turned into something new, like apartments, a boutique hotel or even a defence museum. Here we have a site which the Defence Force has used for many, many years, not been used to its full potential. So there's plenty of opportunities and potential what that site could be used for. The barracks, commissariat and drill hall buildings are both heritage listed. That will need to be taken into account for any proposed development. And before work can begin, current activities will need to be relocated. What Defence uh, is beginning to do is to transition the uh, current involvement that's here at Patterson Barracks to uh, new and, uh, and to be developed facilities at Youngtown. The Youngtown Barracks will receive a $5 million federal government upgrade as part of the transition. Tasmania has a great reputation for engagement in Defence cadets. Per capita you, uh, you really do uh, punch above your weight so we want to make sure that there are great places for the cadets uh, to, uh, to participate. Planning is also underway for a new barracks to be built in Launceston's northern suburbs. The Patterson Barracks move is expected to take between three to five years. A further contribution of $250,000 will go towards a business case for a defence innovation and design precinct. It's hoped that could be built at the current UTAS Newnham campus once it's moved to Inveresk. But for now, the future of the Patterson Barracks is in the community's hands. Now we have a process where the public will be able to have their opinion and I think it's just going to be fantastic. Monika Dadson at Southern Cross News. The Tasmanian salmon industry is again attracting unwanted attention, this time from some of the state's top restaurants. The government has slammed the public stance by several chefs to remove salmon from the menu. The Minister for Primary Industries and Water today livid at the news some Tasmanian restaurants won't offer salmon on the menu due to transparency concerns. I condemn in the strongest possible terms uh, this boycott on our Tasmanian grown salmon. The announcement several top chefs including award-winning restaurant owner David Moyle and Christian Ryan from Hobart's top shelf floating restaurant Aloft have joined forces with Environment Tasmania came yesterday. It's a move the Greens say isn't surprising. People are clearly saying that this government is failing to regulate the industry, uh, the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability. 
means that people don't have confidence in the salmon that they're serving on their plates. The Greens using the opportunity to again call for a stop on the Oakhampton Bay expansion. Although unable to appear on camera, those involved in the Sustainable Salmon Chefs Charter insist it is not a boycott, saying restauranters rely on being able to source quality ingredients, and a huge part of that is knowing exactly where produce comes from, how it is bred, raised, fed and killed. The government remains adamant the industry is more regulated than ever before, and salmon producer Tassel says it respects people's right to protest, but would like to reassure Tasmanians that strict guidelines are in place. The Greens and Environment Tasmania who have pushed this fear campaign uh, and to result in this unfair, unjust and an insult uh, to all the employees that work hard every day uh, for our salmon industry. Jesse Gilmore, Southern Cross News. Investigations are continuing into a shooting in the state south overnight. Police say a house on Austin's Ferries Main Road was shot at soon after six o'clock. A bullet was fired through a window. Luckily, no one was injured. Police are now calling for witnesses who noticed anything suspicious in the area. Anyone with information should contact Crime Stoppers. A Tasmanian primary school class is among eight chosen to name the new fleet of Qantas Dreamliners. The nationwide competition began in May and attracted more than 60,000 name entries. After the excitement of learning their name, Dreamtime was a winner. The Latrobe primary school students have been busy putting pen to paper. This would what they would look like for ourselves. And we did things that reflect of Australia and we did Qantas and the name Dreamtime. So there's been a lot of uh, brainstorming and designing going on and we've got lots of travel plans now and I told the kids it was a once in a lifetime experience that we're sharing. The new fleet of 787 Dreamliners will take to the skies next year. Tasmanian-based scientists from the CSIRO have developed a world-first notification system to combat illegal fishing around the globe. A third of the fish in Australia's market is claimed to have been caught through illegal methods, costing the Australian economy millions of dollars a year. As the third most lucrative crime in the world, illegal fishing is not an easy industry to combat. So it's estimated that about $23 billion is lost from legal fishers each year to illegal fishing, uh, something on the order of 26 million tonnes of fish. But scientists from the CSIRO, in collaboration with Indonesian authorities, are confident that they might have what it takes to identify high-risk operators and alert authorities. What we do essentially is we watch their uh, vessel tra tracking systems and we can tell if they were waiting in an abnormal place or moving in a strange way. We can also tell if they're trying to shut off their tracking systems so that they can be monitored. The technology has gained the interest of international surveillance organisations and will allow authorities to receive alerts when offending vessels arrive in port and to look up ships and check their safety rating. Direct measures are going to be much more effective than slow, subtle legislative processes and there's, you know, a, it's, this is a globally important issue. These scientists claim that 30% of the fish in Australia's market is caught through illegal methods and this alert system will prevent the Australian economy losing millions of dollars. It also affects protected species. Illegal fishermen don't follow the rules around catching seabirds and turtles and sharks, and so they affect the environmental sustainability of, of fisheries. The UN-backed program is set to launch this October. Louise Hedger, Southern Cross News. As the freezing temperatures of winter settle in, Tasmanians are again being reminded to be vigilant when heating their homes. RACT Insurance says almost half the house fire claims it receives each year are made between July and September. The most common causes? Wood heater ash not being disposed of properly and heaters left on in unattended rooms. But also things that we don't often see, uh, items left on standby, so TVs left on standby mode, uh, have been the cause of house fires in the past. Homeowners are also being reminded to check their insurance policies to ensure they are covered for house fires. 
Now let's take a look at the day's business and finance with thanks to Tazplan, your local super fund. The share market has closed barely higher amid modest gains by heavyweight financial and mining stocks. The ASX 200 index has risen by 4.3 points. A short time ago, the Australian dollar was trading at 75.78 US cents and 84.39 Japanese yen. To TSL now, and North Launceston's gutsy win over the Blues on the weekend has not only cemented them as a true contender, but showcased what developing young ruckman Alex Lee is capable of. Lee stepped into the role when Daniel Rusendahl retired and has proven himself a worthy replacement. Instrumental in the Bombers' hard-fought win over the Blues on Friday night, star ruckman Alex Lee is now a big key to the side's premiership hopes. I guess I learned a lot from Ruza when he was here, so paying the back up to him. And yeah, learned a lot from him and the other coaches that were here last year and, and this year as well. And I guess it was kind of put on me to, to perform because the team depended on me sort of thing, which is a good feeling. Despite missing out on the official votes, coach Tom Couch rated Lee best on ground. And he's not the only one to notice the young ruckman's progression, with Lee recently earning a call-up to the state squad. Big honour, yeah, that's it. And uh, kind of get noticed, starting to get noticed for the work that you're putting in, week in, week out sort of thing. And Lee says the playing group shares Couch's belief that despite some impressive wins over quality opposition, the Bombers' best footy is still to come. Our consistency kind of drops off in times, but then we make up for it. But if, when, once we put together a good, solid four-quarter performance, yeah, we'll be, we'll be very, very happy. Meantime, Clarence veteran Ian Callanan has praised his young side's heart after the Roos finished strongly to claim bragging rights against old rivals Lauderdale. Oh, it gives us huge confidence, you know, obviously... Um, you know, you talk about AFL level, they talk about how fit you need to be and that's one thing we've prided ourselves on in the pre-season to get super fit. So, you know, we've got huge confidence in the way we're playing and how fit we are. The Roos take on Devonport at home this weekend while the Bombers have the week off. And the votes are in for the RACT Insurance Player of the Year in the TSL after round 12, with Brad Cox Goodyear's heroics earning him the three votes in the Bombers' win over the Blues. Bo Sharman was best on ground during Devonport's first win of the season in the North West Derby. Hobart City Demons' Charlie Wyatt took the points in his side's 54-point demolition of the Tigers. And Ian Callanan was judged best of field in Saturday's Eastern Shore grudge match over Lauderdale. To the leaderboard and Tom Couch and Jay Bowden remain locked at the top with Launceston gold magnet Rully Keller Mansell and fellow blue Brody Palferman two votes back. South Hobart will have their biggest test of the season this weekend when they take on title favourites Devonport, but South are certainly no slouches, fresh from a 5-1 thumping of Launceston City. Devonport will do, would have done their homework, they'll be ready for us, um, and I think on Saturday it'll be a very tough game. Darcy Hall made a triumphant return to the club, scoring twice during the weekend's win. South sits just one point off the strikers at the top of the ladder. Another big result for up-and-coming Hobart rower Megan Volker overnight, with her team Mercantile finishing third at the Holland Becker Regatta in the Netherlands, or Hobart sailor Matt Bug has finished second at the World Parasailing Championships in Germany, with a fifth and a first in the last two races, not quite enough to secure the overall title. Good evening, Hobart 12 degrees today, Launceston reached 15, Burnie and Devonport 13. Temperatures range from minus 3 at Cressing and Ross to our high of 15 at Launceston. Most numbers below average though. Meanwhile, Mount Reed registered 15 millimetres of rain or snow melt as isolated showers crossed the west and far south. St Helens 14 degrees today, Lowhead, Wynyard, Friendly Beaches, Bushy Park and the Islands 13, Strawn 12, Grove 11, Liawini a high of 5 degrees. Extensive low level cloud is around and over Tasmania, there is a band of High level cloud moving over the nation from the Indian Ocean, and meantime, a separate band of cloud is over southern WA. The stream of low level cloud is there over our region today, mainly the west and south, clear skies over the north and east, with the snow capped highlands also showing through. High pressure ridges join two high zones over the east and west of the continent tomorrow. A cold front tracks over the bite, and a couple of troughs sit over inland Queensland and central regions. Westerly winds will tend northwesterly tomorrow at 10 to 20 knots over the west and south. Lighter winds inland and more variable over the north. Swells decreasing from 4 metres during the day. 
A partly cloudy 13 for Hobart, 13 also for Adventure Bay, Taralea, a cool one, a top of 10. For Launceston, morning frost and fog, minus 2 to a top of 12, 12 the high also for Devonport, 13 the top for Bridport with a late shower. Burnie, a possible shower, 13 the maximum, a shower or two in the west, Strawn 12 and Marawar 13, while for St Helens mostly sunny and 14, a cool start for Swansea but 14 the top later, 13 the high for White Mark on Flinders and a possible shower. There's Wednesday's chart. We can uh, see showers over the north and west extending to most areas during the afternoon. Showers again on Thursday. Some small hail thrown in with snow down to 500 metres. Widespread morning frost on Friday followed by a fine mostly sunny day apart from a morning shower over the southwest. Partly cloudy weather for all the centres on the North Island tomorrow. Brisbane, Cairns, Darwin and Alice Springs all plus 20 but looking fairly cool elsewhere. Clear and cool at the moment, 6 degrees in Hobart, Launceston 4 and 5 in Devonport. So we've got Tom Cooper with us now, Joe. He obviously slipped through our screening process, not disclosing he was a Collingwood supporter. Are we going to cope? Well, I'm not coping. I'm going to get him over to Hawthorne. Just give me time. Thank you very much, Murph. Well, that's all from the news team for now. We'll see you soon with updates. Have a great evening. Good night.